Hi everyone, Stepan here. I'm going to show you 10 most common endgames in practical chess play and that applies both to classical tournament play and if you only play Blitz online. These are the 10 endgames that you're going to be playing most frequently. In fact, there's a very small chance that you'll be playing an endgame that's not listed here. I'm going to start with the least common one of the 10, which is Rook and Bishop versus Rook, and then we are going to move up and cover the more frequent ones. Okay, let's begin immediately. So, Bishop and Rook versus Rook is a very complex endgame, and it should be a draw in most cases. And if you set up a random position on the board, it's most likely a draw. There is one extreme example in which the attacker wins, and I'm going to show you that position in a second. But first, I'm going to show you the easiest way to draw this. This is the position you have to know, and these ideas you have to know. This is one of the worst scenarios okay so the defender's king has been pushed to the to the second rank it all looks grim the attacker's king is very good but there's a way to draw so we wait okay and the attacker is going to try to make progress by checking us away there's no progress to be made there so we wait again okay no no problem they check us away we have to go to e8 because d8 or c8 simply blundered the rook away and now if white repeats we just repeat there there's no trouble here we we just repeat eventually white has to play rook a6 and decline the rook trade or rook somewhere else and decline the rook trade because if we trade rooks one bishop cannot win and it should be a draw so we repeat king d7 once again if if rook a7 draw so the only way for the attacker to try and win is to play bishop f6 and now it seems that you are losing that you are in zugzwang every rook move loses for example if you play rook f8 then rook a7 check and king e8 is absolutely forced but after king e6 rook a8 is coming there's no way to avoid mate you resign okay on bishop f6 if you play for example rook h7 then it's even simpler just rook a7 picking up the rook but we have a defense the second rank defense we go king e8 if they check us again it's just going to be a draw so what the attacker can try is king e6 okay and mate threat on a8 but the second rank defense enables us to play for the stalemate trick we simply go rook e7 check and if the bishop takes the rook then it's stalemate if the king moves back, then we just repeat, repeat, repeat and draw the position. So the second rank defense relies on the fact that once your king gets pushed back to the back rank and the opponent's king stands in perfect opposition, you can still check it away with rook e7 and draw the position. Okay, the Philidor winning technique or the Philidor winning position is the only extreme example in which the attacker can win. Okay, so this is the position in which white wins. If you allow this to happen when defending, then you're in trouble. Okay, so in this position, it's white to play. White is winning. I'm going to show you the key ideas. Uh, if white, of course, makes a mistake and plays bishop c6, then second rank defense once again, rook d7 check, draw. If the rook's taken, the, the game is over. The key idea is to deliver checkmate on the back rank in a position in which the back rank can no longer be defended by the defender's rook. So if this rook was, let's say, here, here, or here, or here, we could just play rook f8, checkmate. So we are trying to achieve that, and we are going to need our bishop to block the rook from coming to the back rank in time to defend against mate. We are going to do that by firstly conquering the seventh rank. Okay, so we go rook f8, uh, rook e8 is the only move, and now rook f7. And our idea will be to transfer the rook along the 7th rank until we achieve a position in which we can checkmate and the rook cannot block. The defender's rook has to go somewhere along the e-file in this case. This could be on any other file. If the rook waits uh, along the 8th rank, then it's fairly simple. We go rook a7 threatening mate on a8. Rook h6 is the only way to avoid mate. Uh, everything else loses on the spot. Moving the king is mate. So rook h6 check, bishop e6, and there's no way to avoid mate. Rook a8 mate is coming, and that's it. So the defender's rook has to wait 
along the e file. Rookie 2 is the most resilient. Rookie 3 is slightly simpler for the same reason. I'm going to show you why. Our idea is to prevent the rook with the bishop from covering key squares which enable the rook to go back and block the checks. So depending on the king position, defender's king position, we need to be able to prevent the rook from going back. So now we go rook h7. The idea is to transfer the rook over here or to checkmate over here if the rook moves. So once again, if the rook leaves the e-file, then this, this is just going to be mate. So the rook has to wait along the e-file. So rook e1, the only sensible waiting move. Rook b7, once again, setting up rook b8. Rook c1, the only drawing move. The only way to, sorry, try and draw and try and defend. Still loses. So rook c8 is a defense that's possible after rook b8. And now the key idea in this position is bishop to b3. And it works on other files, but this is the main point. This prevents check, okay? Prevents rook d1 check, prevents rook c2, prevents rook c4. All the other squares are taken. So there's only one square from which the rook could prevent checkmate, and that's c3. Okay, every other move is, is just made immediately. King uh, e8 will have been made because the f7 square is covered. Okay, and now we move back. Bishop e6. Okay, now the rook is no longer defending c8. If we now play rook b8, it's going to be mate. There's no other way to prevent mate. You cannot go to one of the other uh, files and try and prevent mate. So the only way you can continue as black is rook d3 check. We block with bishop d5 and now once again the same mate is threatened so the rook is once again forced to go to c3. Every other move loses straight away and now the win is fairly simple. Once you achieve this position it's very very simple. So rook d7 check, king c8. King e8 is, is easy just rook here and, and and that's it the bishop as you can see covers the f3 square so there's no rook f3 preventing rook g8 checkmate so in rook d7 the king should go to c8 and now once again we threaten mate rook h7 you can see that in this position if the rook tries to block via one of these two files then it, it's not really doing anything because it can just be picked up so if for example rook e3 then rook h8 check you don't have rook e8 because I, I just take it with checkmate. So there's only one move. Uh, king d8 loses to mate in one. So king b8 only move. And now rook b7 check. King c8 only move. If king a8 then we just pick up the rook. So king c8. And now rook b4. Okay. A simple waiting move. And white threatens in this position to go bishop e6. Okay. King d8 would be the only move. Rook b8 check, rook c8 only move that prevents mate, and rook takes c8 and game over. If in this position rook d3 is played, then we have rook a4, and the black rook cannot prevent rook a8 because b3 is covered by the bishop. So there, there's nothing here. If king d8, for example, for example, then we go bishop c4. And once again, no check on d3. Checkmate here, threatened. Uh, King e8 doesn't do anything. Game over. Okay, so this is the technique. Now, I'm going to show you how to practice this. So, all of the end games which we are going to see, the best way to learn them is not to listen to me talk. It's to play them out against somebody. If you have a friend who plays chess, that's perfect. Just set this up on the board. You defend once, then he defends once, and after you do it 10 times, you'll be able to do it blindfolded. Unfortunately, many of us do not have people who want to play rook and bishop versus rook, like me. Okay, at least not many people. So the next best thing is to play against the engine. Unfortunately, engines play like engines. They are going to play weird moves. Uh, they are either going to play the perfect defense, or they are going to put up no resistance if they know that they are losing. Uh, and it's going to just look weird. So I have a way you can practice uh, against actual human moves whenever you want. 
if you would like to be able to play against a human-like opponent all the time, visit Nocti AI. Uh, it's a great platform that allows you to play openings you want, positions you want, anything you want against an opponent that's going to play like a human very close to your own strength. So what you can do is you can play actual games, as I have. I played two games, won both, uh, and then you can adjust the games according to your liking i played one london system because that that was the first game i tried you can if you want to for example play the smith mora you can choose the smith mora and then play it as white play it as black it's going to assign you a rating and then as you progress it's going to adapt to your rating the best thing about this is that you get instant feedback so it's going to give you feedback on your moves immediately if you make a mistake it's going to say that it was a mistake if you make a good move it's going to say that it was a good move one of my favorite things which we are going to use uh, for the Rook and Bishop versus Rook and game is teams. And this is something I've started using with my students already. So you can set up a random position or any specific position you want and play it out. So let's add a new team, uh, create a custom team. Let's call it Rook and Bishop versus Rook. I have the FEN of the Philidor here. Let's save this and now let's play it out. I'm gonna play white uh, against Nocti. I don't know how resistant it's gonna be in this position. I'm I'm not sure I haven't tried it. So I just uploaded this, but let's see. So practice. Uh, we go rook f8 first, of course. Okay, then we go rook f7. Uh, it went to e1, which is slightly odd so now we can immediately go into the position we had with bishop b3 on the other side of the board we can now do it with bishop f3 because there's no rook d1 check yes we're just gonna win quicker okay so here it went king e8 wait and now rook b instead of rook b4 we go rook f4 so it's the same position yeah we just saved us a bit of time because it went to e1 immediately and now it's going to be over uh what did it do it did rook e3 and now bishop check and checkmate yeah that's it so check and then rook f8 checkmate am i missing something no i'm not okay so that's going to be it I mean, you can expect this from a human. Not many humans would know the perfect defense to the Philidor, so maybe it's going to be even simpler. In any case, this is what you can do, and you can add as many teams as you want. Uh, I, I think this is a perfect way to practice. And this is what you get in the free version of Nocti, so even if you don't sign up for a premium membership, you can use this as much as you want. So check out the link in the description. You get more with the premium membership, but I think... The free one is is enough to try it out and it's it's definitely useful uh, let me know what you think and let's go back to the end games bye okay now let's move on to the second or the ninth most frequent end game queen versus queen uh, appears in 1.87 percent of games i should have mentioned that rook and bishop versus rook appears in 1.77 percent Queen endgames are extremely tricky and there are very few rules you can follow if there are multiple pawns on the board. Okay. One thing that should be mentioned is that when there are multiple pawns and one side has an extra passed pawn, it's very likely a win. And unless the other side finds tricks with perpetual check or stalemate, it's going to be winning. So these endgames are about king safety first if there are multiple pawns on the board because if your king is weak if your king is somewhere where the defender's queen can check it forever then it's just going to be a draw the pawn the pawns are irrelevant and then how far your pawn is advanced even if you're down a pawn or two if your past pawn is far advanced that means that you're winning this position is extremely extremely simple white wins very easily because any queen trade leads to a king and pawn end game that's that's busted for black so that's another thing you have to pay attention to if you trade queens in a position where one side has an extra pawn unless it's a very rare scenario the side with the pawn wins 
What I said about far advanced pawns, like this position black is a pawn up, but white is completely winning. So it doesn't matter if you have extra material or, or if your opponent has extra material. In queen end games, if your pawn is far advanced, then that's it. Uh, in this case, the win is very simple. You just go here, push the pawn and, and queen. When it becomes very tricky is when there's one pawn on the board and both sides have a queen. When there's only one pawn on the board, it depends on which pawn it is. If it's a rook pawn, it's very complex. In practical play, even though some positions should be a draw, it's very hard for the defender to draw. This position you can see on the board is a fairly easy win. Uh, let's say we go queen d6, king g2, I don't know, queen g6 check, king f2. The king is always going to be somehow lined up for a queen trade and it's going to be uncomfortable. So let's say we go king g7 here. Okay, if, for example, king e1, we can now go h7, uh, queen d7 check, king f8, and you don't have any more checks. It's just, if you check me, I go queen e8 and, and, and win the game. So if the defender's king is poorly placed, that means that the queens can be traded off. One rule when it comes to rook pawns is that if your king is in the corner furthest away from the pawn, it's a draw because there can be no threats set up. Okay, nothing can be set up. If you, for example, go queen d4 check, I just wait with king a2, king a1, king a2, king a1. Uh, let's say king g7, you try to make progress, queen g3, king f6, and the queen can just keep checking you away. For example, queen f3 check, king g6, uh, I don't know, queen c6 check, you have to stay close to the pawn, um, queen f6, for example, uh, black of course mustn't trade queens, but let's say queen g2, uh, king h7, and you cannot make progress. Your king is well placed to defend and to avoid a queen trade. So you want your king as far away as possible in the opposite corner. Now, there's something called the drawing zones. I don't want to get into extreme detail when it comes to queen and rook pawn versus queen because there are so many rules that you'd be absolutely lost. I should mention that the statistics for the frequency of games came from uh, Karsten Müller's and Lamprecht's uh, essential rook end games or fundamental, sorry, rook end, game, uh, end games. Uh, they provided the data and the statistics and in that book you can find on 10 pages rules for navigating these endgames. It would take two hours to explain just the rook pawn. Okay, some other endgames, like some other pawns, are more complicated and harder to draw. For example, if you're playing against the bishop's pawn, it depends on where the king is. This position is winning for white. This one is a draw because the king is well placed and it's protecting against the pawn. And most importantly, if the king is close to the pawn, then any queen trade can lead to a king and pawn end game in which the opposition saves the game. So these are going to be notoriously dependent on you understanding your position well and when you can trade queens or not. That being said, there are so many tricks in this position that you could lose it, even though it should be a draw. Okay, moving on. Uh, position number eight. Uh, the seventh or the eighth most frequent type of endgame is rook and bishop versus rook and bishop of opposite colors. And there are general things you can learn about these endgames. This is one of my games, which ended up winning one general rule is that when you have opposite colored bishops on the board, whoever's attacking has the advantage. Now, the engine evaluates this as, as a draw, but there's so much pressure on the, on the black position and this pawn is pinned that it's very hard for black to develop and it's going to take a ton of time. Black is going to have to, as happened in the game, play g6, king g7, then move the king even further away and somehow avoid losing the f-pawn. Now, in the game, my opponent lost the f-pawn and still had the drawn position, but ended up winning. So it's about who can activate their pieces quicker and better. I should mention once again that all of these more complex endgames 
can be reduced down to simpler ones. For example, this can become a rook endgame. This can become an opposite colored bishop endgame, which would be a draw. This can become a king and pawn endgame, which would be a draw. So you always have to factor in uh, the reduction of material and whether the resulting endgame is winning or drawn or, or losing for you. So in this case, trading rooks, easy draw. Trading bishops, easy draw. Trading everything, easy draw. Okay. So as white, I knew that I cannot trade material. Okay, you, you cannot really trade bishops. That would be hard to do because they are of opposite colors. So peace activity is key. Okay, now the next type of endgame is king and pawn endgame. This occurs in 2.87% of games, which is fairly low. You'd expect it to be higher, but let's say 33 or 30 out of 100 games of yours are going to result in king and pawn end games. I set up one position which is important, but you have to start with the basic, basic, basic stuff like simple opposition, triangulation, diagonal opposition, distant opposition. I have videos covering all of that in the endgame playlist, so you can study that in depth. Uh, I, I didn't want to get into this here. Uh, but I'll show you this one position. This is a simple example of a breakthrough. And if you don't know this, <clears throat> you can mess up drawn endgames or, or, or even not win one endgames. So the way, the way to break through is b6 and white is going to queen whatever happens. Uh, if the pawn isn't taken, then one, white takes one of these two pawns and wins. If the pawn is taken, it doesn't matter which way it's taken. If a, b6, we go c6 and we either queen this pawn or we queen this pawn. So for example, b, c6, a6 winning. And after b6, if c, b6, then we do the same thing on the other side, a6. And the pawn has to be taken if it isn't the a pawn queens. And if it is taken, the c pawn queens. So king and pawn endgames are very important. The reason they are probably the most important type of endgame is simple. Every endgame on this list, other than rook and bishop versus rook, can become a king and pawn endgame. Okay, that's why you have to know these best. And you can use Nocti to study many, many practical king and pawn endgames. That, that's the best thing. I've already used it with a student of mine. They are using it to practice endgames they, they are worst at. We have concluded that king and pawn endgames are their biggest weakness in the endgame. So I gave the student a hundred endgames to practice and they are just grinding them against Nocti over and over again. Okay, moving on. Uh, rook and knight versus rook and knight in number six. Uh, rook and knight versus rook and knight is extremely complex and again this is one of my games i'm going to show you how i lost okay so in this position we had this on the board and i had white and i played 98 check okay in a position that was completely drawn with best play i managed to lose in a single move after 98 my opponent played king d7 and now i i should have gone back I should have gone back and gained the tempo to do something with my rook. Instead, I went knight d6. And now the, tam the tables have turned. Well, not really. White wasn't winning. But now black is very, very close to winning. My opponent played d4 check and I actually resigned. Uh, if you turn on the engine, the engine says minus 0 0.4 with best play. But I just couldn't see how to hold on. Uh, the engine says king e2. Knight takes f4 and king f3 can be held almost. Knight takes d3, knight takes f5 and there are chances. I got this far in my calculation and concluded that two passed pawns are going to be too much. So I resigned. In any case, even though the resignation may have been premature, here was the way to have a very simple position in which I don't blunder away material. Rook d1 controls everything. If d4, then king f3 and everything is safe. And I would have held on. Now, this position is very interesting because it's thematic for rook and knight versus rook and knight endgames and shows some general rules. King activity and king safety are important. Knight and rook are a very, very strong attacking combination and they could 
made you. In fact, there was one tournament game <clears throat> which I played in round one of the split open last year where I got mated with Rook and Knight. Ugh, and I'm trying to forget that game. I actually should have should have had it here to to okay. It's better that I don't. In any case, peace activity is most important, but king safety is also important. And whose pass pawns are better? I chose this game because the knight is an excellent blockader. You can see that white's passed pawn is extremely inactive because of the knight, and it's very hard to lift the blockade, whereas black has a way to push the passed pawn. So starting with d4 and then continuing with c5, c4, getting rid of the d-pawn gives black a safe passed pawn that's mobile and it's not easy for white to set up a blockade. Okay, rook and uh, knight versus rook and knight endgames appear in more than 3% of all endgames. So this is something you should be studying. Moving on in number 5 is bishop versus knight endgames. And I have to say this is my favorite type of endgame. Uh, the position you can see on the board is the famous fischer taimanov game from 1971 candidates uh, in which Fischer destroyed Taimanov. Bishop versus Knight uh, appears in 3.29% of the game, so extremely common. And Fischer played this game amazingly. So one of the rules we can, uh, or a couple of rules we can mention. There are positions in which a knight is much better. And there are positions in which the bishop is much better. I'm going to show you two games. The first game is this one, Fischer Taimanov, where the bishop completely dominates the knight. And then you're going to see the second game, Avrabak Panov from 1950, which you probably don't know. This is way more famous, where the knight completely dominates the bishop. So, when you have a bishop versus knight endgame, positions with pawns on both sides of the board is favorable for the bishop. Open positions are favorable for the bishop. And very importantly, the bishop can hardly be put into Zugzwang. Okay, <clears throat> the bishop is way more mobile. It can waste more moves and it can move around the board quickly. So it's very hard for black in this case to put white into Zugzwang. Whereas black can be put into Zugzwang very easily because the knight is a fairly restricted piece. Okay. But the knight is better in positions where there are pawns on one side of the board. The knight is better when there is a blockade set up on a color complex that prevents the bishop from moving. And generally, of course, the knight can be better than the bishop because the bishop can only control one color squares. Generally, you want your pawns on opposite side uh, color complex than your bishop so that your bishop is mobile. But in some cases that can backfire because your bishop is unable to defend the pawns. So let's imagine the black knight on e4 with black to move. Black would be perfectly fine. So let's see what Fischer did. Fischer played king d3, knight e7 was played. If, I should say, if uh, bishop takes knight is allowed, the end game, the king and pawn end game is absolutely winning for, for Fischer. So a random move takes, takes, and here, and black can resign because white has an extra tempo and white is coming in so knight e7 played the game went bishop e8 probing the weaknesses king d5 chased away and the king comes in and you can see that because g6 is so weak and because white's king is better and because the knight is extremely restricted black has absolutely no chance here Bishop e8 played, king b7, the knight mustn't move because the g6 pawn is lost, king b5, the king came in, now there are two weaknesses, and the knight simply isn't able to do anything about that. The knight can cover one of them, or the king must keep covering b6. So knight c8, uh, he threw in bishop c6, uh, of course you don't want to get mated, uh, if if you take the pawn then, you know, don't, don't get mated, so bishop c6. Bishop d5, and now, after a bit of probing, the king, the king came to a6, and after this, if black doesn't have this mate threat with the king on b7, it's much harder to, to defend. Uh, he tried to hold on to the pawn, and then finally Fischer transposed into a winning endgame where he gave up, gave up a piece but is going to queen all of his pawns. Uh, he could have won differently. This wasn't forced. Let me just show you what happened. Knight takes, k 
king takes b6 and the knight is completely powerless the knight cannot prevent the two connected passed pawns from winning the game and he won the game so it was important in this position that the bishop had a target on g6 that the king had a way in and that the knight didn't have good squares okay now the next example is even more obvious in this position Averbach has a knight which dominates the bishop completely Th this position is hopeless for black the bishop is restricted all of the pawns are on dark squares so the bishops the bishop has no mobility at all white has a passed pawn on the king side after the, the pawn moves forward i mean it's just you're gonna have a passed pawn and d6 is weak which means that e5 is weak okay Averba continued knight f6 which is a great move you probably cannot go king g7 because your king is going to be stuck in the corner and you're going to be in Tsuktwang, for example something like this uh if you if you don't defend the pawn then i just take the pawn and if you go to the corner then this is i mean maybe, ooh, there might be some stalemate tricks uh if i take the pawn it's stalemate but oh it's not because okay anyway so king f6 he played h6 which is more sensible than king g7 and now simply gh6 bishop h6 there's a passed pawn on h5 knight e4 was played attacking d6 the bishop is is powerless has to go to f8 h6 and what do you do you have to take if you don't take then then i just queen i mean you have no good king moves if you go king g8 then i go king g6 so he took the pawn on d6 was taken king e7 knight e4 bishop e3 was tried and d6 is sort of the end of the game i'm just going to take the pawn and and win the game the pawns are on the same side the knight is very very mobile the bishop can never target these two pawns so the game is hopeless so this example and this example are very extreme but even in less extreme examples you can apply the same principles so you have to think about that when you're being offered to enter uh, a knight versus bishop endgame i've won with bishops won with knights lost with bishops lost with knights i have many examples but i chose to show you the classical ones in number four rook and bishop versus rook and bishop of the same color once again we're looking at a fisher game now these end games appear in 3.37 percent of all the games which again is a huge number generally these are easier to win than when it's opposite colored bishops because any rook trade will not automatically lead to a draw it's going to depend on king position and king activity why if both sides have a light squared bishop then the dark squares are fairly tender and whose king can can come up the board uh, on the dark squares it is going to be better going to be more active therefore the side with the active king is going to have an extra attacker it's all about peace activity and reducing your opponent's peace activity in this position black had an easy throw this is the game fisher versus bolbokan played in 1959 fisher just made a mistake with f4 which gives away the e4 square and doesn't give the white king many options bolbokan could have drawn the game with rook e1 and there's simply no way for white to make progress um, if you try rook f7 for example then rook d1 check and what do you do if king c5 i just keep checking if you play bishop c4 i can just go king d8 unpin and that's fine if king d6 bishop e8 it looks messy but it's fine uh if you take on g7 then i can take on c4 for example or sorry not on b7 on g7 if you take on g7 i can take on c4 um let's see you take on b7 this is okay for white because white has a bunch of pawns but white let's say continues with a normal move like h5 okay let's say h5 then this is the drawing method king e5 check king d4 check and there is no way to make progress okay and if white tries rook f7 white can give up the bishop for some pawns and try to win but it should still be a draw 
Fisher's opponent played g6, and this is a great example of how an infiltration on a color complex is the best technique to win in rook and bishop endgames when the bishops are both in the same color. Now these two squares are for grabs, up for grabs for white, as well as the c5 square. And also the rook now has f6, so b7 is weak. And from this point, the game is completely winning, and Fisher won it very convincingly. It's very hard for black to make a move. He defended the g6 pawn, bishop e6 restricting the rook, bishop c6, g3, rook g7, king e5, the king is too close, bishop e8. He had to cover f7 because the king and bishop endgame is completely winning if we trade. So for example, if, if black uh, plays something random, then check and you, you resign okay bishops of the same color is notoriously winning when one side cannot target any of the pawns and of course in this case black is losing all the pawns so in king e5 bishop e8 was played covering f7 bishop d5 h5 doesn't help puts more pawns on on the light squares has to defend the king comes into f6. You can see that g6 lost the game. The king is on f6. There's just no way. b7 is attacked. If the bishop moves, g6 falls. Rook e6 was played, threatening, of course, rook e7 in most positions. So king d8 preventing that. Rook d6 check. King c7. Rook b6 once again. A bit of repetition. And finally, bishop g8 forcing the rook out. And in this position, black resigned there is absolutely nothing to be done the threat is rook d8 check and then you you win everything if for example king a7 then we can go rook d8 anyway and once the bishop moves away somewhere we can just take on g6 and the position collapses so in these end games king activity is most important and you don't want any weaknesses and you don't want any infiltration squares Okay, moving on, double rook endgames. Double rook endgames appear in 3.5% of all the games. The most important feature is that if you trade a pair of rooks, you are going to enter a rook endgame, which is the most common type of endgame. And that's something you always have to be aware of. In double rook endgames, it's all about passed pawns and rook activity. Passive rooks equal losing. And if you have no passed pawns, it's very likely that you're going to lose the game, despite it being drawn according to the engine at that point. This is a very good example. This is the game Fischer Benko from 1963. Fischer uh, just played uh, the move b5, and Benko blunders. So he played rook takes g4, creating a passed pawn. He could have drawn the game with rook to b8 why because b6 has to be prevented if the pawn reaches b6 then it's marching forward and in this case if c4 b6 is still prevented then you can take let's say king c2 rook f4 now both sides have a passed pawn and it's equal because both sides have play what happened in the game was rook takes g4 immediately okay and fisher blunders Transposing to position I just showed you with c4. c4 is again equal. What he should have done is b6. After b6, they're, they're, that's it. It's the end of the game. Uh, for example, rook b4, b7. And you can win multiple different ways. Let's say king g7. We now go c3. The king, the rook has to stay on the on the b file somewhere if the rook moves away then rook c8 and the game is immediately over so let's say i don't know rook b6 that seems safe and now c4 we just push the second pawn and we win the game instead fisher played c4 which isn't precise and finally benko plays rook b8 now it's equal again king c2 and in this position benko blunders again he plays rook g1 blocking his own passed pawn it's all about how quickly you can queen your pawn. So rook f4 was enough for a draw. It's of course very hard to know that during a game, but you don't block your own pawn. It makes no sense. So rook f4, let's say king c3, and black would have had enough counterplay. Instead, after rook g1, he didn't have enough. 
the king was too close and eventually Fischer won with the two pawns. So double rook hand games, you want passed pawns, you want active rooks and you want to queen as quickly as possible. Okay, now the second most common end game in chess is rook and bishop versus rook and knight and that's something Fischer was extremely fav famous for. These end games appear in 6.67% of all the games. Okay, try to think about that for a second. That's 1 in 15 games, like almost. So that's huge. The same principles apply that you have in bishop versus knight end games. Bishops are better when there are pawns on both sides on the board and so on. Knights are better when pawns are on one side of the board. Knights like closed positions, bishop like open positions. Uh, bishops are great when your pawns are on the opposite color because they are mobile and of course king activity, rook activity, peace activity and weaknesses. This game is a great principle, great to show the principle of two weaknesses. Uh, the game continued rook d1, king f8. Fischer brought the rook to b4 to start probing the b6 pawn, so knight d7 is forced. Then he brought the king in, blockaded the b pawn, and eventually, you can see, black didn't have a lot of ideas, uh, so black waited passively. A rook c5 loses uh, because your queen side and your king side pawns are too weak, weak so rook c6. King d4, a bit of shuffling, and Fischer trades off the b6 weakness. Why? Because if you take this somehow, then b7 is attacked twice. And in this position, the win is fairly simple. He played bishop g8, two weaknesses, king c7 was played, and he just... He played rook c5 first, and then eventually he took the pawn. It's very hard to suggest to suggest a move. Um, king d8 was played, bishop takes h7. Oh no, sorry, king b8 was played. King b8 was played. Bishop takes h7, uh, knight d5. Uh, yeah, knight d5 check was played, and now king f3. And Fisher is a pawn up. These pawns are weak. Uh, in the game, knight e7 was played. He played h4, freeing up his bishop b6, rook b5, and once again, two weaknesses. The bishop is going to dominate the knight. The knight is completely stuck. So in bishop versus knight end games with rooks on the board, it's once again going to be about peace activity, king activity, where the pawns are and how open the position is. In first place, with more than 8% of all of games, are rook and pawn and games and I cannot stress this enough you have to know the basics before you can move on to complex rook end games uh, this is the Lucina position again you can find most of these in my endgame playlist explained in detail but this pattern of building the bridge with rook g1 king somewhere and then rook g4 is the way to win this if you don't know this you may draw you may not enter this position you may think it's 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 a draw so it doesn't matter what what black does let's say they wait we just move out and now eventually because the rook is on g4 there will be no checks we will block all of them with rook e4 and black will resign so this is the lucina another example is the philidor in this case we are playing as black uh, we are defending we just wait until this pawn reaches e6 this is philidor's defensive technique so let's say i don't know rook a7 rook c6 we have to wait on the sixth rank or our third rank to prevent the king from advancing that's key White waits, we wait. When the pawn advances, the king threatens to cross the third rank, and we just prevent it. Rook b1. Rook b2 also works, so does rook b3. It's rook b1, and now there's no progress to be made. If you check me, I'm gonna go here. If you push the pawn, I'm gonna take it uh, with the check, check. And if you go king f6, I just prevent you from doing anything, and we repeat. Wherever the king goes, I go check, 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 draw. So the Philidor position. Lucina and Philidor are the two simplest ones. You can also uh, look at positions where <clears throat> you have a three versus four 
on the king side. So let's imagine black has pawns here, white has pawns here. A draw in theory, but it could be tricky to draw. There are uh, end games with an outside passed pawn. So let's say in this position, black has a rook on a8, white has a rook on on a1 this is a draw if you know how if black's king is on these two safe squares so there are many theoretical rook end games i would recommend that you grab uh, any end game book and study the theoretical ones and then move on to more complex end games one thing that all of these have in common they can transpose to simpler end games and they are the most important end games in chess you have to know this once again listening to me or reading a book isn't going to give you the skills to play them in actual games. You have to play them out against somebody. So I would advise you to play them out against the friend, against the friend, and then analyze. That's by far best. Okay, that's what uh, Jonathan Hawkins says in his book Amateur to I Am. He learned end games by playing them out against the friend, and th that's a great way to do it. Uh, second option: use Nocti. Playing against a human-like AI, which is going to play against you like a human, is a great way to study and replace humans and then finally if you cannot do that use the engine just it's very important that you practice them practice 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 until you can do them blindfold i hope you like the video if you'd like a more detailed look into these end games i made videos about all of them you can find them in the end game playlist and stay tuned for more chess see you soon bye